All right. Everybody awake? Yeah. I like those songs because they um, they, they talk about, uh, well, you know, any reason, we, we like a song because it says things we feel, it says things we believe, right? So, um, you know, whether you're listening to uh, Five Finger Death Punch or Willie Nelson, right, you like those songs because they, uh, they say things that resonate with you. And so as Christians, when we sing these songs, uh, they, we like these songs because they say things that we believe, they say things that we feel. And so uh, Mike and the team, thanks for leading us there. That was good. Um, so we are, uh, we're in week three of a series that we're calling Five Things I Wish You Knew About My God. And uh, if, if you haven't been here in any of those weeks, I'm really encouraged you to go back because this is, like a, this is like an extended conversation that would take way too long to have in one Sunday morning. If I tried that, you guys would never come back. So we took a conversation and broke it into five parts. So if you, if you haven't been here at all, I'd strongly encourage you to go back and check out uh, week one and week two of this conversation. Um, but if you haven't been here, let me just tell you right up front, this, this series is, is my attempt to explain my God to a friend who doesn't know my God or doesn't believe in God like I do. And, and so what I've encouraged you to do is to spend time over the course of the next few weeks thinking about how you would talk with your friends who don't believe in your God, who invited you to lunch. And wouldn't it be awesome if your friend who doesn't believe in God would say to you, hey, listen, I don't believe in, in God like you do, or I don't even believe in God, but I'd be willing to buy you a bowl of sushi and invite you to lunch. I mean, that's a good deal all the way around, isn't it? Hello? <laughs> I mean, even even unbelievers can say amen to sushi. That's a good deal. Uh, so they would, I mean, we're just imagining the scenario in which your unbelieving friend would invite you to say, I want you to tell me about your God. What would you say? Now, I'm telling you what I would say. Now, you may not agree with what I would say, which is fine. But come up with some kind of, how would you explain your God to your friend who doesn't believe in God, who has just invited you to lunch to talk about your God, all right? So um, just a little bit of review. The first thing I would say to my friend as we sat across sushi is, uh, by the way, let me just stop for a second. Somebody said that I should go to Red Bull and try to get a standing discount for our church based on all the times I mentioned them in my teaching. Would that be cool? <laughs> Man, I don't know. We'll probably not do that, but it's a great thought. So... The first thing I would say to my friend is, listen, I don't always understand my God. I just don't always understand. Some of the things he does don't make any sense to me. And, and some of the things that I would think that he would do, uh, he doesn't. And again, that doesn't make any sense to me. So that was the first thing I would say to my friends. And if you missed that, you can go back and check it out, church180.tv. There's a link there that says sermons. I'd encourage you to catch up on that. The second thing I would say to my friend is, uh, although I don't understand a lot of things about God, there are some things that I can know about God. And that's what we talked about last week. And again, if you miss it, I'd encourage you to go back and catch up on that. So the third thing that I would tell my friends is this. I can know a few things about God. And one of the things that I know about my God is this. God is kind. God is kind. Now, um, I don't know that I have ever actually had this conversation in, in this kind of environment. A lot of times we talk about God, we talk about love, we talk about forgiveness, we talk about all things. But this idea of God being kind, I'm really stirred by, there's a sentence in Romans chapter 11. Paul is writing this letter to his friends in the church in Rome. And he says, hey, I want you to be mindful of the kindness and the severity of God. And that arrested me, those, that sentence. I want you to re remember the kindness and the severity of God. So today we're going to talk about kindness. And in a couple of weeks we're going to talk about the severity of God. All right. So um, I honestly think, though, that as a group, not, not just this church, but the church at large, I think that sometimes we've forgotten to talk about or, or we've had a difficult time talking about and appreciating God's kindness. And the reason I think perhaps that we forgot about it is because we are having a hard time getting past the violence and the chaos that currently exists in our world. I mean, if you just look north, you see craziness in Baltimore, right? If you look, if you look to the far west, you see all kinds of craziness in the Middle East with ISIS and all this insanity. If you look into the world of politics, you see all this, this lying and lack of integrity and just this abuse of power. It's just you look at all, the, all of this craziness and, and you think and wonder to yourself, and rightly so, if God is kind, if God really cares, how can all this stuff be happening? Like, how in the world can, can we live in a world in which God is supposedly under control and yet there's, there's children who don't eat? There's innocent men, women and children that are being crucified or killed because they say they believe in Jesus. How does that work when, when innocent children are sold as sex slaves? If God is kind, if God cares, how can all of this happen? And we struggle to get past that question. 
And then, of course, there are those times where, in our own personal experiences, when we've really needed God, and we've cried out to him and said, God, I really need some help here. And it seemed like he should show up, but he didn't. And in those moments, you ask yourself this question, if God is kind, if God cares, if God is loving, how can this happen? And we never move beyond that question. And, and I, I would just say up front, I think it's absolutely important to wrestle through those questions. I think if you don't wrestle through those questions, you're going to have a shallow and an immature faith for the rest of your life. But I also know this. I may never fully understand why God does what he does. I may live the rest of my life and never fully understand why God didn't show up when I thought he should. I may live the rest of my life and not fully understand why there's, there continues to be poverty. I may never understand why innocent men and women and children are crucified and killed for their faith. I may never understand that. That's what we talked about week one. But, but, but let me just back up for a second and just say this. Um, in, in August of this year, I will have been married 18 years to the lovely and talented Mrs. Peterson. And I, listen, I, I, I good for her. Way to stick out, babe. That's good for you. Um, so, not, look, like, here's just the truth, all right? So I'm just going to say something. Um, I don't always understand why the lovely and talented Mrs. Peterson does the things that she does. For instance. <laughs> I, no, I got permission. So. Um, you guys are more nervous about this than that, right? So, okay, now, listen, in our home, like, Sherry is unbelievably meticulous when it comes to laundry. I'm, I mean, I, her, her friends, I, several of her friends have seen how she does laundry, and they're like, I have never in my life seen anyone so meticulous. Like, literally, it just, I, I can't even... Begin to go with it. I can't begin to describe to you how meticulous. I, I will just say this: when the clothes are folded and in the drawer, there is not one spot on them because they've all been scrubbed. There is not one piece of hair on it because it's all been picked off. There's not one piece of lint on it because it's all been picked off. I'm not kidding. Now, to me, I don't understand it. I'm just like, dude, just fold the clothes. I don't call her dude, of course, but <laughs> I'm like, just fold the clothes and put it in the drawer. We're good, right? And but I don't, I don't understand that. Like my my world doesn't work like that. Of course, her. That what she does looks way better than anything I would do, of course, right? All I'm saying is I don't I don't fully understand Mrs. Peterson. How in the world can I fully understand God? Does that make sense? I mean, let's just be honest. Do you fully understand your best friend? Do you fully understand your spouse? Then how the heck could you be so presumptuous as to think that you could fully understand God? If I don't fully understand this amazing lady with whom I've spent the last 18 years and look forward to spending the next 18 years, I can't imagine if I don't fully understand her, how I can fully understand him. And yet we do ourselves its a service of saying, because I don't fully understand God, I'm going to disconnect. I would just say to you, if that's what you're doing, you might actually be losing the best friend and the greatest resource in your life that you've ever possibly had access to. And sometimes I wonder, and I think through this, like, if the things we can't understand are keeping us from understanding and enjoying the things that we can understand about God. You see, again, I don't understand exactly what goes in. I, I don't understand Sherry when it comes to laundry, but I do tell you this. There's so much about her I absolutely love and adore. She's my best friend. She still takes my breath away. I still have a crush on her. I can't wait. I, I mean, I literally want to leave church and go to lunch with her right now. I've been smitten by this girl. There's things about her I don't understand, but there's so much that I do. And so much that I appreciate and enjoy in spite of the fact that there are some things that I don't understand. So to this matter of kindness, someone who is kind is, is friendly, they're generous, they're gracious, they're merciful, they're compassionate, they're helpful. This is what kind people are. So let me ask you, like, do you know anyone like that? Like, who, when I, when, when I say the word kindness, like, why don't you shout out, like, who comes to your mind? Go ahead, say it right now. There you go. Kind. So uh, the, the idea of kindness is, is kind of difficult for me to grab, put my mind around. So I Googled it, right? And I found some pictures that might actually, that help me, that might actually help all of us to get our minds around this idea of kindness first. So let me just show them to you. I love this. This was a picture that was taken by someone, and, and they were watching this young, she has great shoes, by the way, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
So I, someone took this picture of this couple. They were really, they were, you could tell that they were, they were busy, they were, they were moving quickly, and they saw this old man trying to cross the street, and they actually stopped, turned around, and went back and helped him cross the street. Isn't that awesome? That's helpful. That's, that's kind. That's, that's generous. And then you'll remember this from, from a winter ago. Remember this picture? This cop in New York City, it was, it was brutal winter out, and he found this homeless man who had no shoes. So he went into a store and bought him a pair of winter boots, and there he's helping them put them on. I mean, that's, that's unexpected graciousness. That's, that's helpful, that's kind, that's generous, that's compassionate. And I love this next picture. So this, this gentleman here is helping this lady with her purse. Again, a lady snapped this picture. This guy was hustling to catch his train in, in New York City, a subway. He's catching the catch, hustling to catch his sub. And uh, he saw this older lady working her way down the stairs, and he stopped and came back and helped her down the stairs with all her stuff. Kindness. That's kindness. That's generosity. It's compassion. It's mercy, right? How about this? Pouring rain. This young man sees a, 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 a disabled lady in a wheelchair and stops and look at him. He's, he's not dry, right? He's wet, but she's dry because of his kindness. He's, he's offering generosity and helpfulness. And this is probably one of my favorite ones here. This is a picture of a man who's helping his wife learn to read again after a debilitating stroke. This is what kindness looks like. Right? It's patience and, and compassion and helpfulness. And of course, we can't talk about kindness without talking about Mother Teresa, right? Look at that. She kind, with kindness and, and graciousness and compassion, grabs the face of an orphan and pours love into him simply by being in her presence. That's what kindness looks like. Kindness looks like someone who's helping and and caring, and they're generous, and they're gracious, they're merciful, they're compassionate. That's what kindness is. Now, I personally believe that God is kind for three reasons. Number one, he says he's kind. Right? If you read through the scriptures, one of the things that God will say about himself is, I'm kind. This is what I do. I'm kind. Now, we talked about this last week. The best way to learn about someone, the best way to know someone, is actually to listen to what they say about themselves. And to listen to what others say about them. And God has said about himself multiple times, this is one of my characteristics. I'm kind. I'm generous. I'm compassionate. I'm helpful. I'm, I'm, I'm gracious. I'm merciful. I am these things. And other people throughout history have said the same thing about God. So, so God says it about himself. Others say it about him. So I, I've come to this conclusion that God is kind. The second way I know that God is kind is that Jesus was kind. And we talked about this last week, that, um, that Jesus, Paul said in Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, if you want to know something about God, just look at Jesus. And everything we know about Jesus, is it, it can be summed up with this. He was a very kind man. He was a gracious man. He was loving. He was helpful. He was compassionate. He was merciful. He was all those things. And if I believe what Jesus says about himself, he's like, I represent the Father. I represent God. So if I believe that Jesus was kind, therefore I must believe that God was kind. And the third reason I believe that God is kind is because I actually have experienced his kindness. I've experienced the kindness of God. And my guess is that if you're in this room, you have too. Let, let me just demonstrate that to you by asking you two questions. Number one, have you ever received something that you didn't deserve? Like a second chance or a gift? We, we call that grace, right? It's getting something that you don't deserve. So my favorite story about grace is, I think I've shared it with you before, but it's just one of those that, that just needs to be told. It's like a benchmark story about grace. When I was 15 years old, I dropped out of high school because I was smart enough I knew it all. So I dropped out of high school. And um, I didn't get a job. So I just stayed at home. And, and my parents, my poor parents were in the squad. They're like, what do we do with this kid? Like, do we kick him out? He's 15. He's not working, but he's eating, right? He's just, he's just being here in our house. And he doesn't do much. He doesn't add much value. He actually adds a lot of stress, a lot of turmoil. Um, it was a punk. Like, I don't, good gosh, I'm glad he was my dad and I'm not my dad. Because that wouldn't have worked out well. So, um, during that time, I had a girlfriend who lived in another state. She lived in Tennessee, we lived in Pennsylvania. And I called her and called her and called her. And that was before Verizon, um, that were in AT&T, iPhones. By the way, this is stopped just for a second. So I was telling my kids the other day, this is a while ago, we are telling our kids, we're like, you know, when mom and dad grew up, we had phones that were connected to the wall with a wire. Like, we didn't have internet. You know, we, didn't, we weren't able to drive down the road with a, with a phone up to our ear, and they looked at us like, where were you born? <laughs> so, yeah, so we didn't have unlimited minutes, right? So every time 
You guys remember that, right? Like the phone bills. So my dad would get these phone bills and hundreds of dollars in debt. Like hundreds of dollars. He was like, so this is insane, man. Like you're not working. You're not helping with a phone bill, and yet you're, you're blowing it up. This is not good. So this went on month after month. And I accumulated literally hundreds and hundreds of dollars in debt, and I did nothing to resolve it. I just kept calling on the phone, disrespecting my mom, disrespecting my dad, being a punk, just terrible. One morning, my dad took me out to breakfast, and he laid out all the phone bills on the table. And he said, I want you to look at this. And he, he added them all up. Again, hundred, almost $1,000, just an insane amount of, of <coughs> um, long-distance charges. He said, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay these and forgive your debt. And then I'm going to give you, and he pulled out of his wallet, a brand new $100 bill. And he said, I want you to just start again. And in that moment, I actually did. The, the, the next couple of weeks, I went out and I got two jobs. And, and in my, that moment, my life was transformed by an act of grace. I got something that I didn't deserve. I deserved to pay all of the bills that I accumulated. I did not deserve a $100 bill. I did not deserve his grace. And yet he gave it to me. And, and what I realized is like, just like what my dad did for me, I have received a lot of second chances from God. In fact, if I were God or if you were God, I'd probably be just a faded memory by now. I mean, God would probably have had this conversation with me. Son, you've messed up too many times. We're done. In fact, you're done. Now, if you're honest, you probably could say the same thing. Like, I have had a similar experience. I've had a chance, and I blew it. And then I had another chance, and I blew it. And another chance, and I blew it. And another chance, and I blew it. But somehow, here I am sucking air. See, what my experience has been, that God graciously and kindly forgives me when I ask, it gives me a second chance and more opportunities to live well. And I would imagine that if you're honest, you probably had an experience or two like that as well. So the other question I would ask you is this. Have you ever deserved something that you didn't receive? So the two questions are, have you ever received something that you didn't deserve? Or have you ever deserved something that you didn't receive? So when I was about 20 years old, uh, my, my friend, James Cassidy, was killed in a car accident. And about that same time, I was in a bad car accident. James died. I lived. Uh, here's the thing. James was just about as good as a young man as you could possibly imagine. I mean, he loved God. He sang bass. And he, the dude sang bass. Like, does anybody in this room besides Joe Call know what bass is? <laughs> I mean, there used to be... Uh, this this genre of music called quartets. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Um, and yeah. And and the bass was the guy that's like really really low. Right. That guy. And uh, James could have been a professional bass singer. In fact, he was touring around around the country singing bass with a group. Amazing voice. Loved Jesus. He was going to be a missionary to a South American country. An amazing amazing guy. And me, I I was just getting high and disrespecting God. That's what I was doing. James was loving God, he was serving God, he was doing ministry, and I just was doing exactly the opposite. And I remember sitting at James' funeral thinking, why him, not me? I deserve to be the guy that ran off the road. And that's one of those things, to be honest with you, I have to put in the I don't understand box. I don't understand why, why God spared me and let James go. I don't understand that. I don't understand why he died and I lived. I know I deserve much worse than I've received. We call this mercy. Not being given what you deserve. See, if God gave me what I deserve, if you got what you deserve, chances are you wouldn't be sitting here with the person with whom you're sitting. You wouldn't be driving what you're driving. You wouldn't be living where you're living. Like, if you got everything that you deserve, life would look differently for you. Amen? Amen. All right. So, you may not fully understand or agree with this idea that God is kind. So, what I want to do is I want to tell you this story. And then I want to give you three ways that you might begin to actually experience the kindness of God based on the story. So about 2,500 years ago, um, in, in the city of Jerusalem, it had been destroyed by the Babylonians, right? This, this crusading force that came through just wiped out Israel and wiped out Judah and, and ultimately destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And uh, Babylonia is actually modern-day Iraq, okay? Um, for a long time, the people of Jerusalem had heard, like, look, if you don't get it together— 
there's, there's trouble coming. If you don't get your act together, if you don't start lining up, if you don't start listening to what God is saying, if you don't follow his ways, like there's going to be trouble. And let me just take a, a side note and, and just say this. I think if you look across our culture, if you look across our nation, I think we're in crazy days. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think politics is the answer. I don't care who we elect next, next cycle. I don't think that's going to fix the issue. I don't think new laws are the answer. Right? I don't think more medication is the answer. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe the next, the next answer is going to come from a heart change on the inside. And that essentially is God of transforming men and women from the inside out. You can't legislate love. You can't legislate good acts. You can't legislate wisdom. You can't legislate kindness. You can't do that. It happens when we're transformed on the inside out. And I just say to you, I think the next hope for our generation is a revival, a spiritual awakening, where you, it could possibly even start in our hearts, where we begin to seek God and allow him to transform us from the inside out. That's the next hope for our, 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 our gener the next generation, for our culture, for our nation, for our world, quite frankly. I think that's where our hope lives. And, and so, essentially, the people of Jerusalem, there was chaos, and they, they had been warned over and over and over, if we don't transform, if we don't change our ways, craziness and chaos and destruction is coming. And, and so um, they continue to disregard God. They continue to disregard his best ideas. And so it happened, right? God let the natural course of events take place, and ultimately Jerusalem crumbled. It was destroyed from the outside, from invaders. And uh, by the way, let me just say this. We'll talk about this in a couple weeks. But I think this is the, one of the ways that our God, my God, our God, um, actually demonstrates his frustration with us, his anger towards us, his punishment towards us. And that is he simply lets us have our own way. I mean, parents do this with kids all the time, right? I'm telling you, don't eat that candy. I know you've already ate a bag. Don't eat another bag. I'm telling you, don't do it. And they're like, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm like, okay, go ahead. You'll learn for yourself. Right? I think that's how God functions sometimes. Is he lets us have our own way, and we end up destroying ourselves. And this is exactly what the people of Jerusalem were doing. They are disregarding God. They are dishonoring, disrespecting. Eh, they were saying, God said, all right. They ended up self-destructing. So Jeremiah was a man that God had used to, to warn the people of Jerusalem that this day was coming. Look, if you don't line up, if you don't start, you know, regarding God, if you don't start living life according to his way, you're going to be in trouble. And he was called a prophet, and his warnings were written down. A lot of the things that he said were actually written down, and, and we find them in our Bible in the book of Jeremiah. So after the city of Jerusalem had been completely destroyed, uh, the chaos, the, and, and the violence, all the craziness, it was just unavoidable. It was headline news. And the excessive brutality that was happening in the city of Jerusalem, it was literally comparable to what's happening in the Middle East today. Just, just the violence and, and, and the disregard for human life, it was insane. It was, again, comparable to what we're seeing in the Middle East. And Jeremiah wrote an editorial uh, that was published. And we have a copy of it in our Bible. It's called Lamentations. Jeremiah was lamenting the state of his city, the lamenting the state of his people. And let me just read some of it to you, uh, and it's, it's pretty graphic, all right? So this would probably be like a rated R movie if, if we were to make a movie out of it. So this is from Jeremiah uh, in chapter 2. I'll start in verse, uh, verse 20. Jeremiah says, Lord, think about this. Should you treat your own people this way? And, and so this is a picture. This is actually uh, this is a destroyed city in the Middle East. And I love this picture of a man. I almost picture like Jeremiah like literally walking through the destroyed city. And uh, thinking and having this conversation with God, right? Uh, should you treat your own people this way? Should mothers eat their own children, those they once bounced on their knees? Should priests and prophets be killed within your temple? See them lying in the streets, they're young and old, they're boys and girls. They've been killed by the swords of the enemy. I don't know, are you guys tracking what's going on with ISIS right now in the Middle East? Literally, kids are being destroyed and killed because of their faith. They're being destroyed. <coughs> Jeremiah said, should this be happening? You've invited terrorists from all around. In the day of the Lord's anger, no one has escaped or survived. The enemy has killed all the children from my carry and race. I'm the one who's been afflicted. I've seen the afflictions that come from your anger. Then listen to, listen to the stuff that he says about God. He's led me into darkness. He's shut out all the light. He's turned his hand against me and against all day long. He's, he's shut me down. He's made my skin and flesh grow old. He's broken my bones. He's besieged me and surrounded me with anguish and distress. He buried me in a dark place like those long dead. He walled me in. I can't escape. He bound me with heavy chains. This guy, this is a bad place to be. He goes on. He's hidden like a bear or a lion waiting to attack me. 
He's dragged me off the path and torn me in pieces and left me helpless and devastated. And you're saying, we're talking about kindness, right? <laughs> okay. He drew his bow and made me a target for his arrow. He shot his arrows deep into my heart. My own people laugh at me all day long. They sing their mocking songs. He filled me with bitterness. He made me chew on gravel. Yeah, right? I did something to my teeth. He rolled me in the dust. Peace has been stripped away. I've forgotten what prosperity is. I cry out. My splendor is gone. Everything I hoped for from the Lord is lost. And then he says this. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. All right, when I see this, I mean, this is a man who's surrounded by destruction. He's surrounded by chaos. And he says to God one of those things that we said on week one of our conversation. He says, I don't understand how you can let this happen. And let me just stop for a second and say, Jeremiah is talking about a city that's been destroyed. But my guess is that there are some in this room who almost feel like what Jeremiah said about the city is true of your life. Like, I've been shut down. I'm in a dark place. God, it feels like you've, you've attacked me like a lion. It feels like you've shot me with arrows. You, I'm destroyed. I'm in a really, really, really bad place. How can you let this happen? It doesn't make any sense. But then Jeremiah said something that's fairly instructive. For those of us who believe in God, and for those of us who believe that God is kind, this is what he said. He said, yet yeah, in spite of everything that's going on, I still dare to hope. I don't remember this. Let me just stop for a second. I'll just say to you, if you're in this room this morning and your life is caving in and it seems dark and it seems like you've been totally torn down to the lowest possible common denominator, if you've been absolutely wiped out, Jeremiah said, I've been there. It's been a bad place. It's been a dark place. I'm not sure why God let me go there. But here's what I want to say. I still have hope when I look what he said. When I think about the faithful love of the Lord, never ends. His mercies never cease. He said, great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The inheritance, obviously, is something that's yet to come. He said, I'm in a dark place, but my inheritance, that thing which is to come, that's God. He's going to be in my future. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. Then look what he says. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies. For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. For he does not enjoy hurting people, causing them sorrow. I read through all that, and I read about a man whose life has absolutely fallen apart, and he said, and yet, in spite of all the craziness, in spite of the, the, the chaos in my life, I still have hope because I believe something to be true about God. I believe that God is kind. And I believe that somehow, even though I don't understand all this craziness going on, I believe that my kind God will somehow rescue me here. Now, again, I know that, that probably in this room there are people here that say, yeah, it's crazy right now. It, like, life doesn't make sense. I've got a job that isn't working for me. My relationship is going crazy. I've got addictions that are controlling me. I've got this stuff that's in a dark place. Could I just say to you that my God is kind and if you will hope, and if you will do the things I'm going to tell you in just a second that Jeremiah teaches us, if you'll do these things, you too can discover and experience the kindness of my God. That's what I would say to you if we were eating sushi. Now, Jeremiah gives us three actions. And that if we'll do these things, will actually set us up to understand and, and enjoy the kindness of God. Even when we're surrounded by events and circumstances that we don't appreciate, we don't enjoy, and we don't fully understand. And I, I'm going to tell you right now that the, thing, the three things that Jeremiah is going to teach us, they're, they're not necessarily the easiest words to hear. But they will be most effective. And they will absolutely open up the door for you and for me to experience God's kindness if we'll listen to them. And we'll do them. This is what Jeremiah says to people who are in chaos. Look what he says. 
Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demand. The first thing that Jeremiah would simply say to us is, you need some silence in your life. The truth is, we don't do silence well, do we? I mean, think about it. Get in the car, radio. If it's not radio, it's Facebook. Why are you driving? Or texting, or emailing. Why are you driving? Right? Always noise. Always something going on. <clears throat> and therefore, we miss much of what God would say to us. Because God is not going to compete with your radio. He's not going to compete with Netflix. He's not going to compete with YouTube. He's not going to compete with any other form of noise in your life. This is God's way of working. He speaks when we're quiet. God has spoken to us through his scriptures. He speaks to us with his Holy Spirit. But we run the risk of hearing what he's saying when we are too loud. So let me just ask you, like, when was the last time that you were just quiet, doing nothing, looking at nothing, listening to nothing, just being quiet? Because it's in the silence that we actually come to hear God. And things begin to, to work together. We begin to understand sometimes the thing that God and his kindness is leading us towards. I would just say to you, if you really are in a dark place, the best gift that you could give yourself is to carve out time for quietness. And I'm sure that when you do these things, you actually begin to, to hear things and, and see things that you've missed because of all the noise. Jeremiah said, let them sit alone in silence. When there's craziness, when there's chaos, when you don't understand, my God is kind. And the best way to begin experiencing and understanding his kindness is to carve out time to simply be quiet. To carve out time to just listen. I promise you this, listen. I've tried this discipline of, of quiet meditation. And I've set a timer for five minutes. I would sit down in my chair. And I would start... Be like, good gosh, we're gonna be like four minutes and thirty seconds. I looked down, be like thirty seconds. <laughs> right? We're so busy, our minds are so rushed. But I promise you, gang, if we're not quiet, we'll miss the voice of God. We'll miss the whispers of God, because that's how He speaks to us. Be quiet. If you're in a dark place, my kind God wants to say something to you, but you gotta clear out some space to hear. The second thing that Jeremiah urged the people who were in chaos to do, what he said? He said, let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. For some of you, that would be the coffee table. You could lie down on the coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> but really what Jeremiah means is, this is a position of repentance. It's basically me getting on my face and saying, oh my God, I am screwed up. I am sorry. It's asking forgiveness. It's saying I'm sorry. See, I, I know about my life, and, and you probably know the same about yours, that much of the chaos in my life is the result of decisions that I've made. Right? I, I mean, we, we, we so stupid, we reap stupid. That's how it works. <laughs> And in my decision, a lot of times, the chaos in my life is, is a result of my decision not to follow God's best ideas. And I, I find that even now in my life, when I move away from God's best ideas, whether it be in, in relationships, whether it be in money, whether it be in attitudes, whether it be in work ethic, whatever, whatever it may be, when I move away from God's best ideas that he outlines in here, typically that decision is followed by some form of chaos. There's a great proverb that was written by Solomon, and this is what it says, one of my favorite ones. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then are angry at the Lord. Right? Like, we do stupid things, we make bad decisions, and then we look at God and say, why? He's like, are you kidding me? Like, did you not connect the dots? And, and so what Jeremiah is saying to us here is, is that rather than getting mad at God for the chaos in our lives, maybe we should repent and ask him to forgive us for our disregard and disrespect. I mean, just think with me for a second. Are you more likely to be kind, to be gracious, to be compassionate, to be helpful to someone who is repentant or defiant? Come on. Right. 
Are you more likely to be kind towards someone who is humble or arrogant? Right. Do you think our God is, is much different? If I approach him with arrogance and hubris, is it likely that he's, he's going to look at me and say, well, well sure, you, what our God requires of us is that we approach him with a repentant heart. I mean, if we're always lining up against God, if we're always defying God, if we're always blaming God, if we're never listening to God, but always pointing at him and saying, it's your fault, it's highly unlikely that we're going to experience his kindness. Jeremiah's counsel is, look, when you come to our, to our kind God, repent. Like, own your stuff. The third action that Jeremiah urges people in chaos to take is this. Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies. Really, this is just an attitude of humility. Now, humility is not something that we see a lot of today, is it? Um, I'll, I'm a, I like Instagram. I'm on Instagram. I like Twitter and all that. But I see I see pictures of people on Instagram, like especially dudes who are taking off their shirts and flexing, and I'm like, dude, what do you put your shirt off, fool? Don't do that. Yeah. What are you doing? Right? Like people who are they're, they're so <laughs> stuck on ourselves. Like humility is not a, is not a virtue that we have much of. Like here's the definition of humility from Google, right? A modest or low opinion or low view of one's importance. Humbleness. Like realizing that when you walk in the room, you're not the most powerful person in the room. Like, I'm having this conversation with my kids right now. The other day I saw a, a shirt on a young girl that said, I'm awesome, deal with it. <laughs> and it, you know, these, these kind of shirts, see a shirt? I'm awesome, deal with a sucker. I mean, that is kind of funny. But it's terribly wrong. <laughs> right? It's terribly wrong. <clears throat> it's hard to be around people who actually think like that. Isn't it? It's hard to be around people who are um, full of themselves, arrogant, and filled with hubris. That word has been used twice in today's sermon. That's a record. <laughs> it's hard to be kind and compassionate and gracious to people who think they're better than everybody else. And Jeremiah spoke to those people who would listen and said, look, I know you're in chaos, and I know it's crazy. But if you're going to experience the kindness of God, let me encourage you to have a heart of humility. You're not important, the most important person in the room. You're not as awesome as what you might think you are. You do need help. But what I've discovered in my life is that an attitude of humility in front of my God typically precedes an experience of his kindness. When I approach him with a repentant heart and say, I'm sorry, and when I approach him with an attitude of humility and says, I'm not the biggest, smartest, wisest, richest, coolest guy in the room. And I probably should keep my shirt on when I do selfies on Instagram too, right? <laughs> it's amazing what happens. See, I would say to my friends that I believe God is kind. And if I were sitting across the table from them, I would say, I, I found, on the screen, I found <laughs> that I experienced and enjoy God's kindness when I'm silent, when I'm willing to repent, when I'm humble. When I'm silent, I'm willing to repent, when I'm humble. Those actions will set us up to experience what I believe is true about my God, his kindness, even in the midst of craziness. So the question I would ask you is, how have you found God? Have you found him to be distant? Have you found him to be abrasive? Or have you found him to be close and kind? So if we were sitting at, again, at sushi, and you asked me to describe God's kindness, how to experience it, I would, I would simply encourage you to, to take time to be quiet and think about your life. I mean, literally pull out your calendar and carve out a meeting with yourself. Time to be quiet. Time to think about your life. I would encourage you to repent of bad decisions that you've made that have steered you into chaos. And finally, I would urge you to be humble, to approach God with a spirit of humility, to tell him your story, and to ask for his forgiveness in your life. Now what we're going to do is the band is going to come up in just a moment. 
And they're going to lead us in words to God. Before they do, I, I want to talk to God. And I'll invite you to quietly pray along with me this morning. And when we're done, uh, there's going to be a, a team of people. And they're going to actually, they'll be standing in, in the very back of the information desk. Like if you walk out of these doors, there's a little room to your left. They'll be in the back of their, their prayer team. These are people that we know, we trust. I trust them. If you want to pray about something, if you want to process something out loud with this team, they'll be available in the very back uh, of the, in the, by the information desk back there. And we're going to end this our time together on a higher note. We're going to sing the song, The Time Has Come. And I love the first part of this line. It says, I found a love beyond all reason. Like, it doesn't make sense the way God is kind to us. It doesn't always make sense the way God loves us. But what we have discovered is that we have a God who is kind and is loving and is ready to be that in your life. If you'll simply do the things that Jeremiah talked about, be silent, repent, and be humble. You'll discover something beautiful about God. He's available and loving and kind. Now, Father, this morning, God, would you forgive us for our, for our haughtiness, for our arrogance? Forgive us, Lord, for um, acting in ways that don't represent uh, you well, uh, Father, there are people in this room, I'm sure, that are going through dark places. That their, their life is like the city of Jerusalem was. It's crazy. It's falling apart. But I believe we have a kind God who is available and will be kind and loving in our lives and will simply listen. Repent. Be humble. God will begin to access this reservoir of kindness, this reservoir of love. Like Jeremiah said, this is our hope. Father, I pray for every man and woman in this room today that we would reach out to you this morning and say, God, I need your help. I, I ask you to forgive me for my craziness. I'll receive your instruction. I'll be humble before you. Father, we're going to celebrate your kindness. We're going to celebrate your love. We're going to stand up and, and say with the words of this song that we found a love we found something to stand for. We found something to stand on, to build a life on. That's the love of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus. Hear our songs as we sing them this morning in the name of Christ. Amen.